Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, June 15, 2006. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. For this week, we turn to the only of the four main ingredients of beer that we've neglected over the past year, water. Greg Noonan, celebrated brewing author and brewer, takes us through the essentials of what we need to know about hydrogen oxide, or H2O. Somebody's brewing and their beers are fine just the way they are. Don't get their shorts in a knot over the water. But first, let's get into the mail. I had a couple of responses to my solicitation for experiences with Better Bottles, or the Better Bottle, the plastic carboy that's advertised as being better than glass. Well, first, we have a celebrity audio response. Hi, James. This is Jeff from Craft Beer Radio. Last week on your show, a listener sent you an email about the plastic carboy called a better bottle. I just wanted to let you know I have two of these, and I really like them. They have a lot of benefits. Being plastic, pet plastic, that is, they're not gas permeable. They're not supposed to absorb flavors or odor. They're lightweight. They don't have to worry about them breaking and slicing open a, an arm or a leg, which is quite nice. They have a racking port at the bottom, which makes it really easy to transfer your beer from vessel to vessel. There are a couple things you need to take care of when you have these better bottles. The plastic is fairly soft and scratches fairly easily. A good example of that is one time I was using a better bottle as the stand for my counterflow chiller. And I have one of those fill chillers with a garden hose and metal hose clamps on the end. And the hose clamp scratched the neck out of the top outside of my better bottle really badly. So I could just imagine what a little bit of abuse on the inside would do. If I ever have to scrub the inside of my better bottle, I take a thick sock and put it over my carboy brush before I stick it in the bottle just to make sure that there's none of the metal on the tip of the brush that are gonna, is going to touch the carboy. One of the really neat things that I do with the better bottles is that I use the CO2 created from the primary fermenter to purge the secondary. What I do is I run a hose from the top of the primary to the racking port on the secondary, and then I put a bubbler on the top of the secondary. So during the whole week of primary fermentation, it's creating CO2, and it's using that to push through the secondary. So by the end of the week, it should be just about all CO2 in the secondary. And then when it's time to rack, I run a racking hose from the racking ports on each bottle, and then I run a second hose from the airlocks to each bottle. So what happens when you transfer the beer is that the beer flows through the low hose and the volume that is moved pushes the CO2 across the top hose to fill in above the beer in the primary. This might be overkill for keeping oxygen away from your beer, but it's kind of fun to have such a geeky contraption when you're wrecking your beer. So all in all, I'd have to say that these better bottles are light, they're not breakable, they're easy to carry, they're easy to rack, You just have to be careful about scratching the insides of them. You need to treat them like they're really fragile because they are really fragile. Well, I hope that helps explain some of the pros and cons of a better bottle to your listeners. This is Jeff from Craft Beer Radio. You can find our show at craftbeerradio.com. Thanks, James, for playing this comment. You're welcome, Jeff, and thank you for taking time to send in your comment. You know, we're all about the geeky contraptions here at (laughs) Basic Brewing Radio. You know, I thought the tip about using the sock was very useful, and uh, I plan on using that on my glass carboy, a clean sock, uh, that is. And I never would have thought about using CO2 from primary fermentation to fill the secondary fermenter. Very cool. You know, you could check to see if your second carboy was actually full of CO2 by lowering a lit match into it, or I guess even a lighter if you could figure out how to keep it lit. If the flame went out... Uh, that would be a good indication since flame uh, is extinguished by CO2. And since CO2 is heavier than air, you can get an idea of how much CO2 is actually in the carboy by seeing where the flame went out as you lowered it into the bottle. A drawback is, of course, that your next batch of beer might taste a little smoky. Might be time to, <laughs> might be time to do a, a, a good smoked porter. Uh, Greg from Peachtree, Georgia, also writes in on the Better Bottle issue. Greg says, I haven't yet been convinced to give up my glass carboy primary fermenter, but I have found a great use for the better bottle. I usually let my ales ferment completely for 10 to 14 days in primary. I then rack to a better bottle equipped with a spigot. I use this as a secondary fermenter slash bottling bucket. I'll leave my beer in the better bottle for about a week to clarify and to be sure fermentation has completely finished. 
Then I can pour directly into my bottles without having to rack again. A bottling racking cane fits perfectly into the better bottle spigot. I'm not as worried about bacterial contamination via scratches in secondary as I am in primary, interesting point, nor do I need to clean as aggressively since there is no croisin ring, so I'm less likely to scratch the plastic anyway. I asked Greg how he primes his beer, and he says he doses each bottle with a sugar solution. And Greg says that you could also use the priming tabs or priming drops, too. Well, thanks, Greg. On a different topic, uh, Glenn from southeastern Michigan writes, you made mention of podcast listeners Larry and Ryan, who were brewing 12 batches using different hops. My homebrew club, Craft, that's the Clinton River Association of Fermenting Trendsetters, recently performed the same task on a larger scale. 26 members all brewed the same basic extract beer with the same Nottingham dry yeast and half an ounce of northern brewer hops for bittering. Then, each club member chose a single hop they would use for both taste, 45 minutes, and aroma, 20 minutes. Each member then donated 26 bottles back to the club and in return received 26 assorted hop experiment bottles. The only drawback we've seen so far is most probably due to our use of Nottingham yeast, Glenn says. Each beer has an almost heffy, clovey, citrus uh, taste to it, no matter what hop you're tasting, making it hard to differentiate between the 26 hops. Well, thanks, Glenn. Uh, That's a good point. If you're going to do an experiment testing for hop flavor and aroma, you probably ought to have a clean fermenting yeast that won't impart flavors of its own. Kirk from Hasluck, Germany, writes about a sort of accidental experiment that his daughter helped get started. Kirk writes, I came home one fine day to see a Y-East smack pack in the middle of the living room floor slowly growing. My daughter had found it in the refrigerator and started playing with the golden package. I scrambled together ingredients and went through my malt pails, measuring what I had on hand. After sitting at the computer with my beersmith program, I decided that I had enough ingredients to slap together a right proper Irish red, or brown ale. Uh, Since the yeast was an Irish ale that I was saving for a stout, I decided to go with the Irish red. The next day I mashed and sparged and added my first hop, a mix of northern brewer and tetanger, all I had for bittering, my daughter talking my ear off about everything under the sun. Uh, Kirk says, I counted down to 30 minutes and realized I had forgotten my flavor and aroma hops, East Kent Goldings, in my hop box in the freezer. I turned off the burner, reminding my daughter not to touch anything, and ran inside for the hops. Kirk says, I returned and finished the brewing, chilled with my wort chiller, whirlpooled, and siphoned off the goodness. When the wort was almost finished, I could see something in the bottom of the kettle. It was not a hop or a protein. After I had, after I had everything in the fermenter, Shaken and bunged, I went back to the kettle and looked at the foreign objects. There were two long-stemmed, plant-looking items in there. Confused beyond expression, I asked my daughter if she did anything. She said, I saw you putting pretty green flowers in, so I did also. What plant? I asked with care. The ones outside the kitchen window. I scrambled to the kitchen window and looked. It was my wife's herb box, Kirk says and where the parsley should have been, there were divots. (laughs) Thankful that it wasn't a poison plant, I reminded my daughter not to do that anymore and went about cleaning. Because I hadn't been prepared, I had a mishmash of bottles come bottling day. A month later, it was time to try the beer. Hearing one of your shows, someone wrote in asking if bottle size affects the beer taste. I had 250, 330, 500, and 750 milliliter bottles in the emergency Irish red with parsley. So I set up a blind taste with some mates that came around. Kirk says, I was shocked with the results. 250 and 330 milliliter beers tasted green still and had that apple-like flavor. 500 and 750 milliliter beers were perfectly conditioned, had a better head retention, and I must admit the parsley gave a nice touch of spice to the beer. The only thing I can think of, says Kirk, that would affect the beer as such is the higher number of yeast cells in the larger bottles. The larger bottles, uh, larger bottle beers were completely different from the smaller beers. After a month, the small after another month, the smaller bottles tasted much better and were comparable, 
or comparable to the previous large bottled beers. Very interesting. Uh, I appreciate uh, the story from Kirk. Very entertaining and uh, informative. Uh, so maybe when it comes to bottling, size does matter. I don't know. I asked Kirk how he primed, and he said that he batch primed that particular beer. Very interesting. I mean, the if everything was stirred up properly, the amount of sugar per yeast in each bottle should be the same. Uh I don't know. We'll have to work up another experiment here in the basic brewing labs uh, to test, uh, do the test ourselves. So thanks to Kirk again for the fun story and the experiment results. Speaking of bottling and conditioning, Jerry wrote in after seeing our mead experiment on the video podcast. And uh, I don't know where Jerry's from. He says, I have successfully made one batch of mead, a one-gallon batch in May of 99, Looking now at my notes, I bottled it after one year, and after drinking it the first year, wrote strong alcohol taste, need a lot more time. Uh, Jerry continues, in August of 2005, after six years, six years, I opened another bottle and was pleasantly surprised. It was much like a dry wine and a red color, just a bit more than a white Zinfandel. I think I still have one bottle left. Hearing about the ancho chili mead, Makes me want to make a five-gallon batch like you have and split them up into similar fashion. Well, thanks for the note, Jerry, wherever you are. <laughs> we mentioned on the video podcast that uh, if you don't like the taste of your meat at first, don't give up. Let it age a while, and it may come around to more of your liking. You know, Jerry was patient for six years, and it paid off. I want to say howdy to Mike in Columbia, Maryland, and everybody at the Flying Barrel Homebrew Shop in Frederick, Maryland, who bottled 15 gallons of beer in under an hour recently while listening to a couple of episodes of Basic Brewing Radio. Mike says the shop had a keg of a wonderful stout on hand, making the job go faster, or so it seemed, he says. Uh, so great, a lot of great email this time, and uh, I love hearing from everybody, even though I don't have time to read everybody's note on, uh, on I want to say on the air, but we're not really on the air, are we? On the wire, I guess. Now on to our interview with Greg Noonan on water. Uh, Greg is the author of New Brewing Lager Beer, Scotch Ale, that's the eighth title in the Brewers Publications Classic Beer Style Series, and also Seven Barrel Brewery Brewers Handbook. He's also owner and brewmaster at the Vermont Pub and Brewery in Burlington, Vermont. Well, Greg Noonan, welcome to Basic Brewing Radio. Well, thank you. Very happy to be here. Happy to be on your show. Well, you know, I have to be honest, you weren't my first choice. <laughs> uh, I contacted Charlie Papazian. I've been looking for an excuse to interview Charlie Papazian, of course. And uh, I didn't just want to do a gratuitous, you know, Charlie Papazian, you're so great, you know, type of interview. <laughs> so I said, you know, water's a good subject. Uh, and he wrote back saying, uh, water isn't my best topic, especially if it gets all too technical. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he, I asked for a go-to guy on, on water, and he said, you. Well, that was very nice of Charlie. I very much uh, am uh, flattered by that recommendation. Yeah, no pressure. No pressure there at all. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> uh, Charlie, by the way, has been such an inspiration, I think, to brewing at every level. I look at the craft brewing movement and the home brewing, uh, uh, strength of home brewing, and I look at it. It wouldn't be there if it wasn't for Charlie. Yeah. That that one well-written book back in the 70s really kicked off a lot, didn't it? It really did. You have, speaking of well-written books, in your new brewing lager beer book, you have uh a 40-page chapter on water. That's how many pages it is, yeah, huh? That's right. Unless my, unless that's my math is better. extreme, doesn't it? <laughs> well, you do, you, you do get into quite a bit of detail. It's almost like a, 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 a chemistry uh, textbook, uh, and that's good. You know, if you, you, it's always good to have more detail than, than, less, you know, than not have enough. Uh, and obviously, we're not going to get into that much detail in this conversation. We can't afford to. Uh, but what I wanted to do is, you know, lay some some information out there for home brewers uh, because water is an important ingredient in beer, is it not? It is a huge, huge part of the beer, the finished beer. 
How how important would you say that uh, that water is? You know, it's not important unless it's a problem. I think that's really the first thing that could be stated. You know, I think that uh, somebody's brewing and their beers are fine just the way they are. Don't get their shorts in a knot over the water. That that's a good uh, that's a good rule. If you if you brewed beer and you're coming out with good beer, then maybe you shouldn't be concerned. Exactly. You know, I think you can really sum it up to say that there's only really three reasons to be concerned with your water, and uh, have to delve into it. And what, <laughs> excuse me. I think the first of those reasons is if you have problems with mash pH. I think most people at mash use pH papers to check their uh, mash range, the pH range, to make sure that the enzymes will be doing their job. And pretty much for me, that's a range of about 5.1 to 5.4 in the mash ton. You get so outside of that range, and you're going to have flavor consequences in your finished beer. So, you know, and the easiest adjustments to make are not assault adjustments. They're acid adjustments using lactic or phosphoric acid to adjust the pH of the mash. So I think that's the first reason is for mash brewers who are having uh, pHs outside of that 5.1 to 5.4 range definitely need to address uh, uh, their water and uh, acidify their water so that they get a brighter tasting beer. I think for a lot of home brewers, just the real simple thing is if you have a beer, a home brew, a commercial brew, and it has a kind of a dull finish to it. The flavor isn't bright and uh, uh, really out there. It's all kind of dull and muddy. The first thing to look at is your mass pH because that's such a consequence of a uh, too high a mass pH. Now, before we get, I want to keep to the to the basics here, so that you know we don't assume anybody knows anything. But what exactly is pH? What is that a measurement of? It's a logarithmic scale measurement of the alkalinity or acidity of water, specifically the hydrogen ions that are in the um, water and solution in the water. So, very to simplify that, it's really just measuring the acidity of your water in simple terms. And what does a high pH number mean as opposed to a low pH number? High pH would be alkaline, low pH would be acidic. Uh, It's a logarithmic scale, so 7.0 is neutral. And as you go either direction away from 7.0 in alkalinity up towards 14 and acidity down towards zero, you're not proceeding, uh, you know, a pH of 6 is not um, uh, one-seventh of the uh, acidity greater than a uh, 7 pH beer. It's uh, 10 times more acidic. Kind of like the Richter scale. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. And uh, in, in, in mashing, it's all about keeping the enzymes happy, so to it's, speak. That's what it's all about. I mean, really, that's all it is uh, in a mash ton is you really your only concern there uh, in the mash process itself is giving an environment for your enzymes to work most effectively to produce the results you specifically want. And different enzymes are tailored for different applications. And the rule of thumb has always been in brewing 5.1, 5.4, and it's a really good rule of thumb because you get outside of that and either side you start to encounter problems, especially going higher. You have a mash pH of 5.5, 5.6, or if it rises that high during your sparging, there are going to be flavor consequences. And, and you were talking about it, the, with the, the kind of bright flavor versus the kind of dull flavor. Is that the kind of flavors that you're that you're talking about? Exactly. So that's the first one is a, uh, worrying about your pH during mash. Yeah, I think the only other two reasons for uh, uh, really getting into your water that you need to get into uh, water chemistry are two things. If you're brewing a style of beer that has a mineral character to it. And in general, pale ales have a mineral, mineral character, Dortmunders, uh, uh, specific beers that have a pr- mineral profile as part of the beer's character. And if you're going to do that, you really should be paying attention to the water because the mineral character of the beer is determined by what's in the water. So you really want to, if you're going to brew one of those beers, you're doing it for a competition, you want to win in the competition, you need to fa- stay focused on that. The second reason is if you're using a really lot of hops in beer. It's very anecdotal. It's not well documented in the uh, uh, by brewery researchers, but uh, any brewer uh, whose experience can would agree that 
IPAs is a good example. If you're brewing an IPA, you better add a lot of calcium sulfate to your water. You better get that mineral hardness, and specifically sulfate hardness, up. If you don't, you're going to have a soapy flavor to the beer. Hmm. I think that <laughs> many brewers uh, brew a IPA, brew a really hoppy style of beer, uh, any of the very hoppy styles of beer, and they get a soapy flavor. You know, your first uh, reaction is to blame it on the hops. Well, it's seldom the hops. It's usually the water profile. And again, a high um, level of what's called permanent hardness, cal- calcium sulfate hardness, adding gypsum to your beer. The kind of standard thing for home brewers of adding two teaspoons of uh, gypsum to your uh, brew, k- brew kettle is not bad advice, especially for styles where they're very hoppy, uh, mineral styles of beer. Uh, at our brewery, we um, adjust our water up for uh, brewing our IPA to 700 parts per million of uh, permanent hardness, of gypsum hardness, which is really extreme. We have a hard time even getting the uh, uh, salts to dissolve at that kind of a high level. Wow. But the result is we have a very crisp IPA. We don't have that soapiness. It doesn't have that annoying soapy flavor. So the minerals really cut through yep. that soapiness. They, they just it disappears. It becomes a non-issue. And then you mentioned hard hardness and softness. So that that's another variable in, in water quality. Can you go into that a bit? Yeah, hardness and softness is a measure of the calcium in solution. Depending on what uh, most minerals that are uh, going to dissolve in water are going to do so as a salt. In other words, there are two minerals involved. There's two uh, parts to that. So the hardness and softness addresses calcium, primarily magnesium as well, but calcium is the primary one. Uh, A little detour, adding magnesium to your uh, magnesium sulfate to your uh, water as a way of getting your hardness up is usually discouraged because uh, magnesium tends to dehydrate the body. You put enough magnesium in there and the person is going to spend their night uh, in front of the urinal. Uh, And they're going to wake up in the morning dehydrated. So calcium is generally the preferred uh, mineral to add. And dehydration can lead to hangovers, right? Exactly. You don't (laughs) want to do that. (laughs) Not good. So you want to pretty much avoid adding uh, um, magnesium sulfate to your water, which is Epsom salts. Hmm. Uh, And if you do, you want to be relatively conservative. Back off that detour, we have hardness again is a measure of calcium, uh, hardness and softness. However, there's also what's called temporary hardness and permanent hardness. Temporary hardness is calcium carbonate. If you live in an area where you tend to get a lot of white precipitate building up on your uh, sink, on your faucets, your water tends to be milky, cloudy looking. It's probably temporary hardness, a lot of calcium carbonate in the water. If it's calcium sulfate that's in your water, your water tends to be clear, doesn't build up those kind of uh, calcium uh, deposits. And uh, you generally will have a mineral taste to the water as well. For most brewers, really not a problem what the water starts out as. You might have a difficulty building, uh, brewing a bohemian-style lager that's supposed to be very soft water if you live in the Midwest. If you're on either coast, water's generally pretty soft in the U.S. It's not that much of a problem. So hence, my advice is don't get your shirts in a knot about water chemistry unless you have a problem that you think is associated with that. So how can you tell if you have, if you have water that's suitable for brewing? You know, there's, uh, uh, going to an aquarium supply or picking up some aquarium supplies off the Internet is the easiest way to do it. The three things that you need for water analysis on a basic level that will give you a very broad spectrum are to measure the pH, to measure the hardness, and hardness um, uh, kits are available for about 5 or 10 bucks from any aquarium supply store. Uh, and the other thing is alkalinity. If you're concerned about your mash, pH, a simple way to do it is look at the level of alkalinity that's in the water. Again, al- alkalinity test kits are used by uh, home aquarium owners, and they would have uh, that on the shelves of most, um, I would probably say all pet supplies, uh, aquarium supply shops. And your, your water, or the pH, changes uh, before from before you add your grain to... While the grain Absolutely. is in there, right? So you, if you're taking a, a, a pH test, uh, you should do it uh, while you're mashing, right? And that's the truth. 
you want to see what's happening in the process that you're concerned about. So the water pH and the water itself is not your concern. It's once it's uh, being made into beer that it becomes your concern. So yes, measure it in the, in the mash. And are there any water sources that you should steer away from completely? You know, if you have a water softener in your home, you live in a place that's high, uh, high temporary hardness, and you have a water softener in your home, avoid using it for brewing. Water softeners work to precipitate calcium salts by adding sodium to the water. You're going to end up with a really salty-tasting beer uh, inadvertently if you have a water softener. Hmm. So you don't want to use water that's downstream from a water softener. And in the book, you, you said also surface uh, water sources you should steer away from, like streams. You know, generally only because they're not very pure. Mm-hmm. Generally only because they're pretty well polluted with other things. You know? If you live somewhere where the water pollution is not a difficulty, it's not really a concern. But for most of us, you know, open water sources are pretty well polluted. And, uh, you know, you don't want to be drinking all those uh, PCBs. You know? And even rainwater nowadays. Yeah, it's a shame to say that, but it's true. Now, if you, if you live in a city and uh, get city water, you can get a water quality analysis from your municipality. Can't yes, you? you can. What do you look for when you get one of those? You know, if you're going to have one of those in hand, you better have a guide to how to use it. And there's multiple sources for that. Many of the books written on home brewing, uh, my brewing lager beer, all address water analyses and how to read them. In fact, the reason the chapter is 30 pages long and is a good part of it is about reading a water analysis and seeing what it means to you as a brewer. I think it's 40 pages. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the 10 pages. <laughs> there are a lot of pictures in there, too, though. <laughs> but but again, if you're not having problems... Yep. You know, I think Charlie Papazian says it, wor- worry, uh, says it best, you know, don't worry. Yeah. You know, yeah. have a home brew. <laughs> if it's not an issue, don't worry about it. Don't make it an issue. Now, one, one issue, if you are on city water, uh, you probably want to get the chlorine out, right? Um, yes. Now, you know, this, uh, the, all of that has changed in recent years when uh, a lot of municipalities started adding chloramines instead of chlorine to their mm. water. Chlorine is really easy to get rid of, and generally any home brewer, you're, brewing, you're boiling your water, you're going to drive off the chlorine in the boiling. Chloramines have changed that whole uh, simple way of doing things. They're much harder to get out of your water than chlorine was. Uh, and there's not really a good solution for brewers. However, for most brewers, it is not a, has not proven to be a problem. Hmm. The difficulty that you would be facing with the chlorine is two things. If there's enough chlorine in the water, the first thing it's going to do is going to either slow down, damage, or stop your yeast uh, growth and activity. Hmm. So you're not going to ferment well. Because the chlorine the is... The second thing is a Band-Aid flavor, a uh, Lysol kind of flavor and aroma in your beer. You get that plastic kind of uh, uh, aroma in your beer. Often it's d- due to chlorine. And the, the chlorine Especially is in there... plastic fermenters. The chlorine is in there to kill stuff, right? It so. is. Yeah, I can see where they get in the way of the yeast. So the uh, if you use a water filter, like I have a pure brand water mm-hmm. filter attached to my faucet, and that's yep, taste and odor filters. They're referred to. They're activated carbon that's in the filter, and yes, that will remove the chloramines and re- remove the chlorine. So both of them, it will get rid of. Yep. Yeah, I've read that if you if you set the water out overnight, the chlorine will evaporate out. Mm-hmm. But not so much the chloramines? Yes. Is that right? Yeah, chloramines are hard to get rid of. Uh, I, I, um, what you're suggesting, to use a activated carbon filter, a pure filter, any one of the uh, brands of filters, uh, is a great solution to that problem. And in general, just cleaning up the flavor of water. Mm-hmm. Um, activated carbon will re- remove any organic compounds that are in the water. So if you've got anything in the water that's affecting the flavor of your water, it will remove it, and uh, you'll have better tasting water that you're starting your brewing with. Now, we we live in a small town here in northwest Arkansas, and, you know, sometimes depending on the time of year and the condition of the water source, you know, the the there may be some off flavors in the water, so... Yeah. Exactly. You know that that pure that and not to you know I'm not <laughs> I'm not endorsing that brand, but you know uh, any of those uh, water of those filters, brands. Uh, it just takes yeah, the flavor. And I out. think so many people have those in their homes now. Um, 
that uh, it's not a big stretch. Uh, I think a lot of brewers already have those on their faucets or a water filter uh, jug in their refrigerator, so it's not especially a uh, uh, difficult thing. I'm just looking in my refrigerator, and I have a water filter uh, jug in there. It is a pure brand as well. Yeah, they, I think we have a Brita water pitcher. <laughs> and yeah, Brita makes it, and also McLean and... Uh, a uh, few other uh, brands out there, and they're all essentially the same. They do the same thing. It just takes longer to uh, run, you know, there eight, you go. eight gallons or nine gallons through a pitcher than it does just through the faucet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the voice of experience. <laughs> now, um, if you decide, now, if you live somewhere where, say, you've got a well that's got a lot of sulfur in it or something like that, and, your, and your water is just nasty, and you decide to purchase water, what should you buy? If you go to the store, there's distilled water, there's spring water, there's drinking water, there's reverse osmosis, you know, there's a lot of water out there nowadays. What should you buy? You know, for if you just want to keep it simple, buy, buy spring water. Uh, generally, there's enough minerals in that that are going to satisfy the requirements of the yeast in the fermentation, what it needs for minerals to be able to pull out of the water. Uh, distilled water won't provide any minerals at all. It's basically pure water. Some home brewers I know prefer to use distilled water because they're starting with basically zero in minerals. Mm. They can then add the minerals that they want for the particular beer style that they're brewing and be very exact about uh, their finished results on it. So generally speaking, if you don't, if you don't want to get into water chemistry, you're not uh, going to be really precise about that. Uh, you want to start with spring water, bottled water. However, if you really want to have total control over the beer that's going to come out in the bottles, uh, then you're going to need to, A, be educated in water chemistry, B, have a pretty good supply of the different minerals that you need, three or four minerals, and uh, C, use distilled water. And now is reverse osmosis water, is that essentially, it's a different process from distilling? Exactly, but that same net result. So that it strips all of it out of there. It does. Now, if you're an extract brewer, do you have to worry less about water quality? You know, very good point. It's pretty safe to assume that with extracts, if you're buying an extract that is a, a design for brewing a pale ale, the extract maker is going to have already adjusted the water chemistry to suit the beer style. So... Yes, in that case, worrying about the water uh, chemistry is probably uh, pretty unimportant, again, unless you're ending up with a dull-flavored beer, in which case uh, you just might have too high a pH. Generally, if you look at beers that are on the market, they run somewhere between 3.5, pH 3.5, and about 4.2. <clears throat> Anything above pH 4.0 in a finished beer is a indicator that you probably could get a better, brighter flavor out of your beer by doing some adjustment to the acidity of the, uh, the wort before fermenting it. Hmm. And again, simple additions are uh, phosphoric acid, lactic acid, which are available from every homebrew supply shop I've ever been in. Yep. It's just tiny amounts that you need to add, literally drops. Hmm. And experience is the best way to do that, is, you know, Adding a few drops, take a pH measurement, brew the beer, how's it taste? Take a pH reading on your finished beer. What is it? If it's above 4.0, you might want to have a little more lactic acid. And you might want to f find some experienced brewers in your area that are using your water. And you know, I think that's the biggest guidance. resource of all is local shops and clubs where people who are brewing with the same water that you are, presumably, have already dealt with those problems and can save you all the work of figuring it out. They've been there already. They know what to do and can give you the recommendations. Now, are there there are beer styles out there that are better suited to particular water qualities? You Absolutely. Men you've mentioned some, but can you go over some more? Sure. I think if you're going to start, you know, let's start with softest water uh, used for brewing, Pilsner or Kell, the general bohemian style of Pilsner, where you have a very uh, pronounced hop bitterness, hop flavor, and a good malty character in the beer. It's brewed with very soft water. The minerals are not getting in there. Minerals generally will diminish maltiness in a beer. Beers that are very minerally are not usually very malty. Uh, they're not mutually exclusive, but 
the minerals definitely diminish that malty flavor. A uh, little sodium chloride, table salt, will generally, a little bit, will generally accentuate maltiness. Uh, once you get too much in there, it overwhelms the maltiness. Mm. So for styles of beer that you want a real malty character, uh, uh, if you're brewing a northern, uh, northern English style brown ale as an example, a, uh, any kind of a bohemian pilsner, you want to start with soft water. Uh, water that gets into what's called medium hardness. Uh, generally speaking, Dortmunders, uh, northern German pilsner styles, um, pale ales, most of the British pale ales that aren't northern brown ales uh, benefit from a medium hard water. Very hard water, uh, you're really limited at that point. Any beer that you brew is going to carry the mineral character with it. It's going to be big in the flavor. Uh, so if you have very hard water that you're starting with, you really should look at the styles of beer that are very uh, complemented by that. And those beer styles are, for the most part, uh, IPAs, um, Russian Imperial Stouts, uh, big, hoppy, bitter beers. And I think that's about a wrap. I should be mentioning Belgians and Saisons. You know, Saisons generally, uh, Kolsch's, uh, both of those benefit from a low to medium hardness. The Saisons are better with low hardness in the water. Saisons actually have a little bit of mineral character as part of their uh, flavor profile. I said Saisons, excuse me. Um, uh, Kolsch's should have some mineral character in the water. Um, German style alt beers, generally a low hardness. Also Munich uh, lagers, Helles lagers, the light colored lagers. Uh, up to a medium hardness of water, they'll still carry maltiness. If you have very hard water, don't even try to brew the style. And those those differences arise not because they've messed with their water. It's just because those exactly. styles are brewed in that water, in that region, right? Exactly. So there, there are some often imitated region, uh, or people often try to imitate the waters of certain regions. That's true. Now, what are, what are the most popular? To me... The one that comes to my mind, I don't know why, is the Burton upon Trent. You know, I would think that would be everyone's answer. Is that <laughs> the most emulated water style among home brewers and commercial brewers is Burtonizing your water, which is basically increasing the calcium sulfate content and ramping it up rather high. You know, 500 parts per million uh, uh, of calcium sulfate is not unusual for a beer brewed uh, in the Burton style. So, and what does that do for you? Again. Again, a mineral character to the water, and that mineral character is very important with highly hop beers. It just gives a good balance to the uh, uh, flavors, the uh, hoppy, uh, hoppy and bitter flavors. It does tend again to mask maltiness, uh, so you're accentuating, getting a brighter, cleaner hop character uh, at the expense of maltiness. You know, generally speaking, beers that are uh, uh, brewers often talk about refined bitterness, noble bitterness, as opposed to coarse bitterness. And part of that is hop variety. The other part of it is um, the water mm. that's being used. And generally, if you're drinking a beer and you have a lot of bitterness going down the sides of your tongue, the back of your tongue, the sides of your tongue, uh, rather than a very clean bitterness down the middle of your tongue, is a pretty good indicator that something needs fixing. Ah. Uh, it's just a lot of really hoppy beers, bitter beers can be unpleasant, an unpleasant bitterness as opposed to a pleasant bitterness. Now, now you, you better be careful or people are going to be, start sending you beers and saying, now what's wrong with this one? <laughs> they can do that. <laughs> <laughs> I found that, you know, I've, uh, even in the past year of doing the show, a few people have sent me beers and and most are proud of what they've sent but uh, every now and then it's like taste this and see what you think what's wrong with this one yeah <laughs> oftentimes nothing's wrong with it it's just uh, something different from what they expected i think well that's a nice thing when you hit that it's <laughs> like you know what <laughs> nothing wrong with this beer let's have another i don't know I'll, hey, yeah send me some more I, I need to do some more studying <laughs> <laughs> well have we hit the high i mean water is a complex topic um but have we have we hit the essentials that uh, that brewers need have. to know? Yeah, I think when you're looking at brewing, whether you're an extract brewer, all grain brewer, or anything in between, 
when you're buying your ingredients and getting your ingredients, you're buying a specific malt type for the beer or a specific malt extract. You're matching hops to the flavor profile you want to end up with. The big variable for home brewers is the water. You're taking your ingredients home, and brewers across the country could brew the exact same recipes, and what's changing the most between them would be the water supply they're starting with. Mm. But again, having said that, it's no reason to panic or think that you need to go out and get your Ph.D. in water chemistry. It's really, uh, if you have a problem, deal with it. If you don't have a problem, just keep brewing. Yeah, and you can develop your own local style. That's absolutely the truth. I mean, that's absolutely the truth. Unless you're competing against other brewers in a national competition or something. And that's the other thing, too, is, you know, I think a lot of brewers, uh, they're not brewing for competitions. They're brewing it solely for their own enjoyment. Brew what you like. <laughs> well, I feel a lot better after talking to you. I, uh, You know, I, I haven't messed with my water, and I've felt kind of guilty, but now... <laughs> well. There's no need to again. This, you know, to me, it's problem and problem driven. <laughs> if it ain't broke. I, I'm going to give you a quick example here of problems uh, with water. Here in Burlington, Vermont, our water is drawn from Lake Champlain, which is the largest natural lake in the U.S. after the uh, Great Lakes. So we have this huge body of water that's coming from. We have very what's well, always been soft water. It's always been very easy to work with. In terms of alkalinity, it's been about below 40 parts per million of alkalinity. No big deal. Our hardness is under 100 parts per million. Soft water, easy to work with. And about uh, two years ago, we started to run into mash pH problems. And in our brewery, we are very uh, specific about uh, our brewing process. We use a spreadsheet that we've created to account for variabilities in our brew-to-brew -brew variabilities in our ingredients. And we started to see the alkalinity of the water rise as well as the hardness. And we started to have mash pH problems. So we adjusted it with uh, lactic acid. And um, at other brews, we use a um, sour mash that we do in-house to uh, acidify the mash. But anyway, we adjusted for that, and we've continued to adjust. We couldn't find the problem. We call the water department. We we're over the th past three years talking to them about it. Nobody knew what the problem was. They couldn't figure out it, was, it wasn't anything they were adding to the water. They hadn't changed their processing. And it occurred to me one day as I uh, looked out at the lake, and on the edge of the lake were a bunch of mussel shells. We've had an invasion of zebra mussels in Lake uh, Champlain. Uh. And there was a big die-off, and that's what made me see what it was. So I started looking, and I found uh, someone who does chemistry on the lake for the University of Vermont and spoke with them, and they said, oh, yeah, the alkalinity on Lake Champlain has gone way up. This invasion of zebra mussels as they die their cells, their shells decompose into calcium carbonate, ah. and the alkalinity has risen way up in the water. So in our case, an invasive species uh, populating the lake has totally changed our water chemistry and what we need to do in uh, brewing. Wow. And it's been a problem for home brewers in the area as well as they've had to adjust to this change in their water supply. So keep your eyes open. There you go. <laughs> and again, it took us two years of asking questions before it was uh, dawned on us that it was the zebra mussels that were the problem. Well, you mentioned a spreadsheet, and uh, we had talked the other day about a about a, a spreadsheet. Would you be? Would you? Was that what you wanted to share? You wanted to share something on the yeah, website? Yeah, you have to. You know, the whole spreadsheet is kind of very complex, and it would be throwing it out to uh, people without a uh, training in how to use it would be pretty pointless. They'd never figure it out. It's just pretty complex. However, what I can do is I can pull the water hardness, uh, the water analysis segment uh, out of it and make it very easy for home brewers. You can, uh, I'll do it in an Excel spreadsheet. And if you'd like to post that on your website, you're more sure. than welcome to. Yeah. And uh, you can just pull the water, uh, pull it up on the Excel spreadsheet, plug in what you want for water and what you're starting for water with the different parameters. You don't need to use them all pick and choose the ones, how deeply you would want to get into it. And it will automatically calculate and tell you, if you want 700 parts per million hardness, it will tell you exactly how much calcium sulfate to add, as an example. Wow. It will uh, plug in your alkalinity of your water and uh, assume that you want zero in the, uh, in the beer itself, and it will tell you how much lactic acid or phosphoric acid to add. Well, that would be great. Yep. 
Now, so with, it'd be with, very handy. With the caveat that neither you or I are are available for technical support, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty self-explanatory. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there you go. But yes, I'm in agreement with you on that. Well, excellent. Well, very good. Well, I certainly appreciate your time. Oh, my pleasure. Hopefully we can talk again. And have a beer. Sounds great. Works for me. We appreciate Greg for taking time out to talk with us. And again, the book with the 40-page chapter on water is New Brewing Lager Beer. It's a very comprehensive book uh, that will benefit you even if you only brew ales. So don't let the title fool you. And look for the link on our site to the spreadsheet uh, that Greg mentioned. And we, again, appreciate uh, Greg for going to the extra mile to uh, uh, volunteer to massage his uh, spreadsheet and uh, make it more homebrewer friendly. So that'll be out there in the episode description of this episode on basicbrewingradio.com. Well, next week, Steve and I wing our way to Orlando. And uh, while we're doing that, Basic Brewing Radio turns 50 50 weeks, that is. Next week, we'll talk more about experiments, including abusing beer on purpose. Then, after 50 consecutive weeks of shows, uh, we'll kick back a couple of weeks. We'll take a couple of weeks off to be with family and friends around the uh, the summer uh, 4th of July holiday season thing. But don't worry. We'll be back with lots of good stuff, hopefully from the... Um, the Brewers uh, Homebrew Conference. If you have uh, brewing questions yourself, show suggestions, or just want to say hey, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from, Jerry. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. And while you're on our site, you can check out our online shop where you can find great pricing on our DVDs and a combo deal to save you even more. In our first DVD, Introduction to Extract Home Brewing, we walk you through the extract brewing process, step-by-step from boiling to bottling. And in Stepping into All Grain, we take you through the all grain process from milling your grain to collecting your wort. You can see a a listing of the fine folks across the country who sell our DVDs on basicbrewing.com. And if there isn't a vendor in your area, you can order it from us online from our little shop, along with shirts and, well, shirts. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> We're working on other stuff, so uh, after the little break, we'll have some more good stuff on you. Or not on you. Well, to be put on you, on the store. Enough of my rambling. That's all until next week. Until then, thanks for listening. I'm James Spencer. It's been 50 consecutive weeks. I'm a little goofy. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dotson. And I wonder how many people actually get to this point in the show. Do you keep listening at this point? <laughs> Write me and let me know. <laughs> <laughs> you pre- do you just skip past the commercial at the end? Anyway, uh, I'm in a goofy mood. I've had too, way too much coffee this morning. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next li- uh, Next, Oh, gosh. I swear it's only coffee. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long. So <laughs> long.